Mm -hmm. Call the meeting to order and ask you to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning and welcome to the October 15, 18th County Commission meeting. I'd remind you to silence your cell phones. The meeting documents are on the end of the counter in the white binder. And if you need listening devices, Robert is in the blue shirt and he can help you. With that, we'll go on to routine business. Item number one is consider a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. The motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number two is approve the commission meeting minutes from October 11, 2016. Is there a motion? So moved. So, second. Motion and a second. Any corrections? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number three is bills to be paid in the amount of $652,641.07. Is there a motion? Pay the bills. Second. And a second. Any comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number four is reports. Item A is the auditor's account with the tre county treasurer as of September 30, 2016. Item B is Register of Deeds Report for Fees Collected in September 2016. Item C is Minnehaha County Juvenile Detention Center's Report for September 2016, and those are all on file at the Auditor's Office. Item number five is Personnel Actions. Item A is Consider a Motion to Approve Routine Personnel Actions. So moved. Second. The motion is second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Item number six is applications for abatement. There are none. Item number seven is notices and requests. There are none. Item number eight is planning and zoning notices. There are none. Item number nine is petition for compromise of lien. Item A is DPNO number 2062 in the amount of 2080, excuse me, $2,028.20. Robert Wilson, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Commission. Robert Wilson, County Commission Office. As uh, Chairman Heiberger, Chair Heiberger just said, the uh, Commission Office has received a petition for a compromise of lien for DPNO 2062 in the amount of $2,028.20. Petitioner is purchasing a home uh, and expects to close on November 8th of this year and discovered this lien in the process of um, uh, preparing the title company doing the um, prep work in, in preparation for that closing. The uh, lien consists of rent and utility assistance along with court-appointed attorney fees. Uh, applicant states that the attorney fees are her uh, juvenile sons and um, she had custody of him at that time, had legal custody of him at that time, but was unaware of the, uh, uh, the charges because he was not actually living with her, but living with her ex-husband at that point. Um, the uh, applicant lists an annual income of just under $27,000. Uh, reports liabilities of approximately $1,100, total assets um, $1,726, um, and uh, has provided earning statements from uh, September, the month of September, um, totaling almost uh, $2,200. Tax return for 2005 listed a refund of $547. The applicant, along with this, um, submitting the application and uh, associated paperwork, has also made an offer of uh, uh, paying $1,000 uh, as uh, um, uh, looking for a compromise and release in full upon payment of $1,000. We've uh, provided you with the application and the, the related documents, and I would stand by for your questions. Okay. Any questions for Robert at this point? I do not see the applicant present. Madam Chair, Commissioner Berg. I'm probably going to support the compromise, but there are a couple of questions I have. Uh, one is uh, the uh, uh, some of the bills go back to 1983, so if it's a juvenile and they were say 10 in 1983, uh, they're a lot older today, and their last bill was from uh, 2014, which is just two years ago. So that's it, a you know thirty some years. So if it's a juvenile, it anyway. The other thing is if uh, uh, that the ex spouse is not listed on this lien as well. It's just in the name of the one party. Uh, those are two concerns I have. But 
I would, I would comment that the ones that were from 1983 are for um, poor release services like fuel and stuff, and so that doesn't account for juvenile, and the juvenile charges don't start until um, 2014. Well, there's a court-appointed attorney that was paid in 86. There is one in there, yeah. There is one in there. That one was paid. Yep. But still, that's a, a pretty old child. <coughs> Commissioner Heiberger. Sure. Um, since the applicant is willing to pay 50% of um, the amount owed and is purchasing a home, which will um, add to our tax rolls, I'd be in support of um, approving this application. I'll second that motion. I have a motion and a second. Is there any other comments? A thousand in the hand is better than two thousand in the bush. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Robert. Next, we have opportunity for public comment. If there's anyone who would like to speak on something that is not on the agenda, good morning, Pam. I came to give you some good news. Oh, we love good news. <laughs> <laughs> um, as of November 9th, the uh, Taxpayers in Minnehaha County will have an opportunity to use their credit card for the services provided at the treasurer's office. That will be at no, co no cost to the county. You know, there'll be a convenience fee. We're doing business with GovTeller. Um, thanks for, to Adam Hensley and his boss at GovTeller and Judy Ziegler who helped work out the details of this contract. Fantastic, thanks Pam. Pam, can you explain what the convenience fee will be? Is that a percentage of the Percentage charge? of the, the transaction. Okay. Do you know? Is it like 2%, 3%? Do you Depends on the volume of your business. Oh, okay. Okay. Any additional questions on that? Well, if I may. Commissioner Pam, that's, uh, that's great uh, that uh, this can be uh, offered our citizens. Uh, uh, and uh, the hang-up before was we couldn't work out a deal. Is that? Well, there was a, there was a, it would, would not be cheap getting into the business because the equipment that you needed to buy was significantly expensive, at least in my opinion. I guess significantly expensive depends on your definition. But since we never have any money left over in my budget to, for anything really, so this is a great thing that's happened. They've been willing to deal with this. I think they have been doing business with some other counties, can imagine what the volume of business will be, so I think it's in the, they think it's in a good deal for them too to get us into the being able to use the credit card and even though we couldn't have to pay them for the um, equipment that they're gonna let us have. Okay. And they're maintaining that equipment as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Is there any other public comment? All right, with that we'll go on to regular business. Item number 10 is a briefing on the Shape Sioux Falls 2035 Comprehensive Plan for Joint Jurisdiction Areas of Lincoln County, Minnehaha County, and the City of Sioux Falls. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning. Thank you, Chair, Commission members, for uh, allowing us to come brief you today. Um, we are updating and giving a minor amendment to our comprehensive plan. Jeff, our I'm going to let you introduce yourself okay. for the TV cameras. <laughs> Thank you. Jeffrey Schmidt, I'm the Chief Planning and Zoning Official for the City of Sioux Falls. And with me, I have Albert Schmidt, who has no relation, just like Jim Schmidt, Lincoln County. <laughs> um, but he's an uh, urban planner with the City of Sioux Falls. And he's the amender of this comprehensive plan. Um, I'm just the staff member on this one. But we are amending our comprehensive plan, which we adopted back in December of 2009. And the county commissioners for both counties adopted basically in January of 2010. Um, the comprehensive plan is very similar to Minnehaha County's Envision 2035. It is the document that sets the, by resolution, the plan for how you want to grow your community. We adopted this plan to 2035 last time um, with our growth projections and our ideas on how we wanted to see it. Every five years, you really try to sit down and look at it and see if it's still functioning properly. So this is our five-year update. When we looked at it, everything was fine. Everything didn't really change. We kept the same goals and objectives and policies. The only thing that really changed for us this time, um, same thing for you guys, is we went through a recession. So in 2007 to 2009, this recession hit, and we didn't grow as fast as we thought we would when we adopted it. So. What we've done is, and I'll have Albert pass out, we updated our tables and charts of what our growth projections were. 
So in summary, what's taken place is previously in 2010, we said we were going to go out to the year 2035 with this much growth. What's happened is we're going to go out to the year 2040 with this much growth. Mm -hmm. So nothing really changed except we have five more years of growth added to the same growth areas, the same infrastructure, the same policies. But um, instead of saying let's just stay at 2035 and move everything backwards, we just added five more years to our plan and we're at the same point that we thought we were going to be back in 2010. So that's what happened with how much growth that we thought we were going to have and where we were at. In the end, I think back in 2010, I was projecting like a 2.2 or 2.3 growth rate, and we actually are at a 1.7% growth rate. And when all you economists, bankers out there, when you have that over 40 years, that's what happens is you can actually gain five more years. So things are looking good. Um, we really try to look at what Envision 2035 is doing for Minnehaha County and what Lincoln County is doing to protect some of these growth areas, make sure that we're still taking care of the land, we're protecting the property rights, getting out ahead of things, letting property owners know it. Um, we had open houses, public meetings. Um, again, it, it's really hard to get people to look out 2035, 2040 to get people involved, but we make it available to people and then we just wanted to come and brief you today and we're still scheduling and looking at the calendars for when we'd come back for the official uh, public meeting and public discussion where we'd vote on it as the three bodies city council and both county commissions we'd have the vote also with your planning commissions and at that time what the vote will be on is the city elected officials and planning commissioners are going to vote on approving the city boundaries and then Lincoln County will vote on what their joint jurisdictional boundary really is and the Minnehaha County Planning Commission and Minnehaha County Commissioners vote on basically what that boundary is on the north side outside of the city growth area and what is that transition area which is what's stated in your Envision 2035 what that transition area is outside of our city limits out to your rural protected area. That's what we're showing is the transition area, the buffers. So, and again, that really hasn't changed since the last 10 years, so. Questions for Jeff? Jeff White. A as we uh, get a larger municipality here and you move further and further into the county, you're going to encounter uh, larger and larger uh, uh, animal operations, et cetera. Do you have a plan for that? Certainly. Um, we've had planning, joint planning with Minnehaha County since well before Scott and I were here, but you know, um, for 30 or 40 years. So we have joint jurisdiction with Minnehaha County. So the plan has been and continues to be that there's a transition area in Minnehaha County to address those large operations. So they don't necessarily expand, they don't add new operations. The ones that are there continue to exist. They have their property rights, so they stay there. But when new ones want to come in, they have to go in front of that joint body and Minnehaha County gets to vote on whether they should be new operations or not. Um, the Chair, city doesn't decide so on that. So as, as we uh, do encounter those uh, existing operations, is there a plan to annex those as well or is there a plan to just go around them? Go around them. We would go around them because they have the property right. Um, as we expand outwards, it's that property owner's general right to stay there until they no longer want to stay there. Um, if there was an annexation, it's that property owner's right generally to come in. We, Albert, is really the one that's on board right now that begins the discussion with them to talk about should they annex or come in. But typically it's that property owner's discussion where they go, yeah, you know, now is the time that I come in. Now is the when I annex. Um, there is an ability to do forcible annexations, but it doesn't happen very often. Additional questions? Jeff, has there been any conversation with any of the smaller communities or input from them on how they will uh, jointly identify some of the needs that they're going to have? Absolutely. Um, we've communicated with all of the communities and I'll try to remember them all as we go around. So we, we've 
in the past, it's been Brandon, which was instrumental at the very beginning, and then T in Harrisburg, and now this last run, we've included Harris, um, Crooks and Hartford. So all of those communities are really, are within not only our growth area, but outside of our growth area and our joint jurisdiction. So it's the same discussion that um, Mr. Barth and you are talking about. What's the growth boundaries for the community, for the counties, for their communities, and in the city of Sioux Falls and in Minnehaha County's comprehensive plan, it really talks about how do you plan to grow and how do you handle the infrastructure. So with some of those communities, it's a lot easier communication and discussion because they have good planning and they talk about how they're going to grow with infrastructure. And some of the other ones, they're just starting to have that conversation. But it's a good opportunity for us to bring it up. So we've done that already. Additional questions for Jeff? Um, I, I guess one of the issues we've had a little is that some other communities have come to us asking for a joint jurisdictional mm -hmm. uh, area. And that's, uh, I as a person on the Planning Commission am somewhat reluctant because we don't wind up with a quorum in our joint meetings and right. uh, then the action is postponed and mm -hmm. uh, I think we had one community that we was only the third time that they showed up with a quorum and even s the city of Sioux Falls has had issues at the Planning Commission level mm -hmm. and uh, I think we've had some issues with our uh, county commission at the joint meetings. Uh, yep. So it's it's hard to set up too many communities to be meeting with uh, yeah. when they aren't coming. Because <laughs> there's volunteer citizenry. Yeah. It's, it, it's really a challenge. Um, and at the same time, you know, I think the, the whole philosophy and discussion is that you want to make sure that these communities are taking into consideration how they're going to grow and develop. It, you county commissioners are doing a fantastic job of really looking at what your resources are and how are you going to manage those resources. These small communities try to do that, but they're taxed even more because they don't have the time and the ability to look at it. Um, so then they don't show up or they're not available to show up and they're not looking at the resources that they have. And they don't have a dedicated planning department like we do. Correct. Staff. They don't have the staff. I mean, they're, they're really to the edge where they're like, okay, how do we make these decisions? And they don't show up. And, they're, and even if they do show up, are they knowledgeable about what they're doing? So it's a tough decision. But we try to help them the best we can. Um, we're also, City of Sioux Falls, and I'm going a little bit off here, are in seven different school districts. Um, and so... That's one of my huge challenges is to talk to those seven different school districts. And the superintendents are phenomenal, but their boards are tough to work with because they are citizenry that come in very frequently and they have to be educated and informed just like you talked about with um, city council members. So, While you were talking about there, that particular issue, uh, um, I'm wondering if there's a way that the city and the county can help these rural communities a little bit with some of that planning mm -hmm. because one of the sticker shocks of all of that quote growth is yeah. always the infrastructure price yes. tag and when people look at that not only are they amazed but I don't think that anybody has a real strong support system in those groups to be able to do it by themselves. I think we try to help them, mm -hmm. and, but I think we need to continue to encourage that. I know yeah. we talk about that in the Mecca and the, the Lincoln yep. County yep. Uh, Development Board, but I, we never put an estimate on some of those t right. price tags, and I think that would be and with the crazy. MPO, yep. and with the MPO, and it's probably something you know, and I'm thinking offhand too, that we have to have a continual discussion like you guys do with the county commissions and the city council. It's that constant discussion versus coming to them at one point and saying can I talk to you now because at that point if it's me coming to that community they're gonna say I don't want to listen to you today and that's generally what happens is I go to the board of a school district and say can I talk and they're like their guards already up and they're not gonna listen to me but if I've been talking to them for a year it's a lot easier conversation well, nobody likes surprises especially no those significant price tag surprises. Correct. So yeah. I think the more we can do to continue to that keep that open, that's a good Excellent idea. Excellent point. Yep. Yep. Commissioner Kelly. Isn't what Gerald was talking about a function of CCOGBO? Uh, 
Yes. And they really don't have a planning staff, do they? Or maybe that's something we ought to be working at is getting to Seacock to – because you pay a lot of money, we pay a lot of money to belong. Um, that maybe they ought to be helping these outlying rural towns. And they probably have the same challenges you and I do. I mean, it's it, and are the communities asking for it, or do you have to be more proactive and go out and do out the outreach? Commissioner Bender, did you have a comment? I just, Jeff. So, folks have questions about this. If they have input to provide, do they contact you, your office? What's the best way yes, for please. them to? Um, our phone number is 367-8888. Our um, email is planning2, the number 2, because it's easy to get people planning2 at SiouxFalls.org. Um, at the same time, we have a w we've improved a little bit. We have a service counter now down at City Hall, so people can just stop at the service counter. And at that point, we bring up all the information and talk to citizens because not everybody wants to call or email or get on the Internet. Um, so we're trying to make ourselves more available for that individual communication when people just go, yeah, and that's really what we found in the open houses. People go, I don't want to go through the 285 pages. Show me where my property is and explain to me what's going to happen to my property. And we can get on the electronic and show them their property and say, this is where it's at. And they're like, well, nothing's changed. And we're like, th they need to see that. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I have one more question. Yep, and Scott, has got a question in the back or a okay. comment. But I'm going to ask Jeff one more question, and um, maybe this isn't for now. But you had mentioned that this, the county is going to approve their jurisdiction, the Lincoln County is going to approve their just jurisdiction, and the city is going to do theirs. Is this still going to be a joint meeting? Because yes. it won't be under one motion. Then it would be under two separate motions. It's I'm just wondering how the logistics of that work. And w and Albert's really facilitating that and working through that. It's a resolution with an agreement. So the maps will be put together and it shows all of those. First, you have to have the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan has to show your growth areas and then the boundaries. And then the joint jurisdiction can be, by state law, up to three miles mm -hmm. or it can be an agreed upon between those communities, which is what Council Member Commissioner Fenwick have brought up. <laughs> um, and so that's where we've been working with those communities to say, okay, we're gonna have an agreement and a resolution, and then we bring that boundary before the joint bodies, and you basically pass that resolution. Okay. So, and then we get all those pieces together, and the puzzle sits there, and you just go, yep, we agree upon that map. Okay. And Scott has a comment. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Scott Anderson, Planning Director for the County. I just wanted to make sure that the audience at home and the, uh, the county commission are aware that at next Monday's planning commission meeting, as um, Jeff uh, indicated, we have advertised a public hearing uh, before the, our joint city county planning commissions, and there will be a public hearing on uh, for the planning commission to make a formal recommendation on the plan. That's part of the process that you have to go through. I just wanted to make sure. Everyone knows it's coming up this Monday. There'll be a public hearing. So it'll be another option, another opportunity for the public to make any input if they want at that time as well. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Additional comments or questions? Okay. Thanks, Thanks City, for coming and giving your report. Um, with that, we'll move on to item number <coughs> 11, which is a presentation by the Sioux Empire Fair Association of the report of the 2016 Sioux Empire Fair. Good morning, Scott. Good morning. Scott Wick. Uh, WH Land Fairgrounds from Empire Fair. Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity this morning. And on behalf of the, of the board, myself and the staff, we want to thank you for your continued support of the fair and of the fairgrounds. We'll get started off with attendance. It was a, a very busy 10 days in Sioux Falls during our event this year. Uh, but we're very proud of the fact where attendance did come in. On, on overall, we were down about 8%. The first five days of the fair, we were positive. Uh, the last five days of the fair with um, uh, events that were in town and some, ex some f extremely hot weather and some high humidity a couple days, we were down the last five days. So overall, we, like I said, we were down about 8%, but with all the activity that was in, involved in the uh, uh, entertainment in Sioux Falls during that time frame that was included in the packet that we had sent out. Uh, Doobie Brothers were in town. We had monster trucks in town. The first uh, river walk uh, w was happening. So uh, with all that that was there, all the offerings that were there for people to go to for entertainment and to, to take their families to, we're, we're pleased with the way that we did turn out. Okay. 
We had a lot of uh, updates again this year that I'll go through and I'll highlight some of the, uh, <clears throat> the notable ones. We did run another 14-foot uh, path of asphalt in front of the grandstand for the food vendors to set up on. That way the food vendors were completely on asphalt. We still had the green space behind them for they could put their stock, but it, it opened up another 12 to 14 feet of pathway in front of the grandstand for people to to walk in front of and to go move back and forth from north to south and also opened it up for a little more gathering space for those that were there earlier for the concerts. Um, phase two of the asphalt in the uh, parking lot by the expo was completed. That was a uh, in-kind donation from the city that was about $75,000 worth of asphalting. Uh, both of our rodeo arenas are up and running. We had purchased that last year, but with the help of all the volunteers, we got that going. There's two arenas there that were very busy. Um, a donated crow's nest and an announcer stand for the rodeo arena. Uh, Billion Automotive um, donated a uh, three-quarter ton diesel pickup for us that we put a snow plow on that will be instrumental this winter. We uh, added 40 camping spots with water and electric to accommodate the pipeliners that were in town that were filled from the end of May through last month. They're completing that project, so there's only about five or six of them that are at our property right now. We added sewer to 39 existing spots. Uh, we upgraded a tractor that was about 30 years old through a municipal lease. So we have a tractor for mowing. We spent about 25 to 30 hours a week just mowing the property with a 15-foot uh, batwing mower. We upgraded 20 vendor electrical pedestals. Um, if you've been out there, you've seen the tie-out barns south of the property, all the rusty roofs that were there. We had a gentleman staying with us for a couple months that went around to uh, different uh, farmsteads and farms, and, and that was his what he did for a living. So we got a, a fairly good deal on that, and we painted those with the help of some, some donations. We added uh, new house lights to the grandstand, which were a safety issue, and some of the entertainers had concerns over the past couple of years because the house lights were, uh, a lot of them were inoperable, but we've, we, we put 10 new ones up there, and now it's, it's much brighter than it was. We did asphalt a pad for the main stage in the grandstand, so even if we do get the rain, um, guests that go to the show are standing on asphalt, and now the stage is on asphalt as well, which makes for a safer environment and easier for all the crews. Um, we added a 10-inch uh, PVC trunk underground, so now the cabling that goes from what we call Monitor World, where they mix all the music, to the stage, the cables are not on top of the ground for people to have to walk over or put cable covers over, which was a tripping hazard. We've uh, updated the main office with some paint and carpet, added security cameras to our auditor's office, carpet in the auditor's office, uh, new signage throughout the property, updated a website. The whole north room of the expo building has been repainted, and we also removed all the non-essential water lines that were in there because we don't use that for heat anymore. That's all forced air heat from four big units that were replaced several years ago. Painted our old shop and we added, uh, we numbered the rows in the parking lot, which was, uh, which was a great help. People uh, appreciated that uh, so we could get them back to their cars. We had every day of the fair uh, sponsored this year. Uh, the first weekend was Premier Weekend, uh, first Premier Bank, Premier Bank card. Monday was uh, BillionAuto.com Appreciation Day. Tuesday was uh, Senior Citizen Day, Grand Falls Casino. Wednesday, Ag Appreciation Day, Touchstone Energy. Thursday was Hungry for Truth, the Soybean Research Council. And then we had Ag Rules Weekend, which is South Dakota Corn. We have retained all those moving into next year, except for the soybean folks. They are going to take a lesser role as far as a uh, sponsorship. So we will have one day that is open there. We also had several very successful carnival promotions. Monday being the biggest day with uh, free, t free admission, $1 rides with a free show. Um, the Beach Boys, Beach Boys was uh, very surprising to me that they were that big of a turnout for everybody. They really appealed to, there was teenagers there all the way to some uh, very, very elderly folks that went and saw it. So that was uh, surprising to me, but very, we were glad to see that. Tuesday we had Half Price Carnival with $15 wristbands. And then with uh, Feeding South Dakota th on Thursday, we had our Cantastic promotion where you would bring in three non-perishable food items and get $10 off. And we, I believe we collected around 180,000 pounds of food for that. 
Next shot is just a picture of the uh, of the Beach Boys concert. Uh, moving on to uh, the Art Center, we had uh, the highest number of exhibits since 2010. We've worked very hard in the Fine Arts Building to uh, do some improvements in there. We were able to uh, pick up some display cases from uh, Shopco when they were remodeling and some different shelving to make it a better presentation for those who wanted to show what they were what they were doing. So we had a total of uh, 1,464 exhibits from 177 exhibitors. Um, some of the largest increases were in needlework and the vegetable entries. Livestock, this is a picture of our livestock from an adult round robin um, competition in the open class market. Oh. Uh, yeah, live, livestock was up a little bit. Our biggest increase was in the goats. And then we had some, uh, some double shows where, where folks got to come to Sioux Falls and uh, show more than once in the same day, which they appreciated to get more in with their travels. So we'll get down to the, the financials. In the grandstand for expenses, we spent uh, 502000 Ground entertainment is everything that's outside of that. Uh, strolling acts, um, different entertainment there, 44. The front porch is the front porch area. That's starting on the first Saturday through the last Sunday. We have free entertainment there. Um, Sherwin Litton and various other groups that are there spent 20000 The Budweiser Beer Guard, we cut back by about two-thirds. Those are bands that are after the main grandstand curfews uh, around 10 or 10.30. So we only had three nights in there this year um, due to the fact that it was very poorly attended on the other nights, and we wanted to uh, cut back. Of course, we have our premiums that we have to uh, pay out for all the exhibitors that show uh, other expenses. Our expenses this year were about $100,000 less than they were last year. Fair revenue. <coughs> um, did I skip one? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, I skipped. Overall entertainment, we spent six hundred twenty-seven thousand. Admin one hundred seventeen. Grounds admissions one hundred four. Advertising eighty-two thousand. Competitive exhibits fifty-nine. Uh, beverage and concessions uh, seventy-four. Arts, horticulture, FFA about fourteen thousand. So coupled with the 100000 uh, less spent in entertainment, uh, we saw another savings of 8000 So our total expenses were uh, $108,000 less than they were in 2015. Now for revenue. Uh, admission camping miscellaneous, um, we took in 363000 The carnival was 262000 Competitive exhibits 143000 Beverage concession 211 and sponsorships were 174,000. Um, we were up in the carnival slightly, up in competitive exhibits. Sponsorships were up 26,000, which we're very proud of. Overall revenue, however, due to the, the decrease in uh, attendance, uh, we were down 161,000 in revenue. So we saved 108,000 in expenses, but down 161 in uh, total revenue. So overall for the 2016 fair, we had uh, revenue of 1,155,588, expenses of 1,081,155, net income of 74,433. Our net income was down 30,000. Um, so overall, our fair was very successful. Anytime you have an outside event, not to be a broken record, but you know we're at the risk of the weather every day for 10 days. And now as we get more and more competitive with entertainment in Sioux Falls and more venues opening up and more opportunities for people, we will continue to uh, you know, travel to the conventions and it's, it's stuff that happens in many, many markets, fairs, and we'll, we'll, we'll retweak our business model to, uh, to adjust to the market and how that changes all the time. So with that, we'll have, uh, there's a nice shot. We had the, uh, this big flag was raised every day and brought down at night with a ceremony and thought it was a nice fitting picture for the end. So if there's any questions. The questions for Scott. I think there was one rain day, or I don't know if it was a whole we day. We had a real significant rain, but it wasn't quite enough to qualify for right, the insurance. Right, it wasn't enough. So. so we had the two hot days real humid, then the rain, but that, that wasn't enough, so. Commissioner Bender. 
So, Scott, I mean, overall, anytime you end up positive, that's always great news. Definitely. Um, the, the expenses, you were down in expenses. Was that because you intentionally were planning? Yes. For, so did you save that on an entertainment primarily? or uh, We saved 100000 on entertainment and a, a little bit elsewhere in some production. We knew going in early on that Doobie Brothers and Journey were going to be at the Premier Center on Thursday night. We thought that Badlands was going to have a concert a big concert during our fair, but they did not. But they did have their monster trucks the last Friday and Saturday. So we it was uh, we we planned we planned to spend less money on in entertainment in anticipation of uh, a busier market for entertainment. Is that a trend you see going forward? Then you know, um, unless I can get all the powers that be together that run those facilities and say, hey, let's you know for this ten days, let's not do anything. Uh, probably virtually impossible with a couple of the groups, um, the Arena and Premier Center. Uh, they they're not they won't purposely bring anything in during our time. But if if SMG does a block buy of Doobie Brothers <coughs> Journey, and they say you are playing at this time in Sioux Falls because it's a routed event, mm -hmm. they then they have to. But they the Terry and uh, Chris over there don't purposely say hey it's, it's the fair let's bring let's bring somebody in. But I would anticipate with. Uh, new facilities being built it's going to get tougher and tougher it was a very very busy week the pro-am tournament was in town um just a lot first friday a lot of things going on okay, commissioner kelly scott your net was about seven and a half percent of your revenue right um is that typical for that are, are there any uh comparable fairgrounds have you got any information on what they do or is that low or high or i you know what they're this is my sixth fair um we have we have netted as much as three hundred and twenty thousand. to this is the lowest amount we've netted in six years since i've been there it it's a very unique business to be in because truly those 11 days one rain day can affect you by 100 to one hundred fifty thousand dollars in a swing so it'd be, it'd be it, you know it would be nice to be making a 250 plus all the time, but if if the, the heat, the humidity, the rain, um, coupled with what else is going on in the market. Now the Beach Boys were sponsored by Billions. Uh, the day was sponsored by Billions. Not yeah. the not the entertainment. Not no well partially. I mean they, I mean there's never enough sponsorship to cover an entire right. show, but they 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 sponsor that day that helps with the uh, the free gate. Um, then we also have our other spot all the day sponsors we get all that into the into the pile and that all helps with all of the entertainment okay. additional questions okay thank you scott this thank is a you part of our contract with the sioux empire fair that they come and give us a report in the fall yes. so thank you very much all right we'll go on with item number 12 which is authorize the chairman to sign amendment number three to the minnehaha county lga 22-13 agreement number Four one zero five two nine with you will take you all take I knew I was going to annihilate it engineering pro um, professionals services for the countywide sign replacement program funded by the South Dakota Department of Transportation good morning Shannon good morning commissioners I am Shannon Schultz assistant highway superintendent the highway department the agenda item before you is a request to sign uh, a contract that the state actually hosts and issues the contract. We're kind of a fourth party to that contract. Again, it is for the assigned replacements that have been countywide, including towns and townships. Um, again, they're replacing non-compliant signs. There was a new reflectivity standard, and to update all of our signs was 100% state funded. And that includes the preliminary engineering, uh, which this agreement, excuse me, amendment number three covers. The reason for this amendment is um, there's three reasons and they're bulleted in your agenda item. If I can, thank you, Robert. 27 additional residential developments to townships were inventoried. Also, there was additional inventory analysis for uh, FHWA requirement to include an encroachment survey, which means that any signs, the right of way is free and clear of any encumbrances. Uh, that was later dismissed. Anyway, this Altec did the work to do that and then inventory and analysis of 14,000 additional signs. So a total of amendment number three is $146,995.36, which is 
which brings the total contract amount to $603,796.06. And again, all 100% paid by the DOT, and we are requesting your signature and approval. Okay, your questions on that? Make mm -hmm. a motion to approve. Motion second. and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, by the way. Uh, all those signs should be replaced this year. Hmm. Good, good. Item number 13 is a briefing and review of the Rural Minnehaha County EMS consultant proposals. Good morning, Robert. Good morning again, Commissioners. Robert Wilson of the Commission Office. As you know, as part of your 2017 budget, uh, you had appropriated $40,000 to engage an indep independent consultant to review the current delivery system for rural ambulance services in the county. Uh, the Commission Office requested and received two proposals from firms <coughs> experienced in this field who have worked in South Dakota recently. Emergency Management Director Lindy Young, Quality Assurance Director, Dr. Jeff Luther and myself have reviewed both proposals. We've also contacted references for both firms, and all of their references spoke very highly of both firms. Uh, Dr. Luther uh, felt that either consultant would do a fine job and prepare a report that was useful for the county both now and in the future. Uh, based on the, the review of the, those proposals, the Commission Office and the Emergency Management Office recommend that the Commission accept the proposal proposed um, submitted by Fitch and Associates <coughs> and we're specifically for the following reasons. The Fitch Associates uh, proposal uh, can be completed within the budgeted amount that you approved. Again, you approved $40,000 for this project. Their uh, um, uh, project came in within that amount. The uh, least expensive proposal from uh, Safe Tech Solutions, the alternative was $25,000 higher. Second reason that we, uh, we felt this was, uh, was appropriate is the uh, Safe Tech Solutions proposal um, outlined an effort uh, aimed at really developing recommendations for a, a goal of developing a single fully integrated EMS uh, delivery system across Minnehaha County. And that, that appeared to be beyond the scope of what uh, you were looking for with this, uh, uh, with this review. And additionally, uh, Fitch and Associates um, with some recent work with the, uh, the City of Sioux Falls. They're familiar with Metro Communications. There uh, are their dispatch operations, and they also have, have some, some direct understanding of some of the providers who work within Minnehaha County. Um, specifically, <coughs> uh, looking at the two uh, firms, in 2014, the City of Sioux Falls contracted with Fitch and Associates uh, to develop the RFP for the ambulance service within the city. For, the, uh, for Minnehaha County, they proposed a review that will take approximately five months, will include um, five on-site meetings and the delivery of a final report. Um, their, their proposal outlined something that I, I, we, we felt really fit what, uh, what our direction was and what you were looking for that uh, would, would propose an outcome of this study would be to provide options and directions for the county to ensure a clinic, clinically sound effective and efficient EMS service for the community now and into the future. <coughs> and again, that uh, proposal was for a cost of $39,200 within a budget of $40,000 that you had uh, appropriated for, for next year. Safe Tech Solutions um, proposed three options and, and they were, our, all our references on them were very good and they, and they uh, proposed a very detailed uh, proposal as well. They gave us three different options. The first option was to produce seven reports, one for each of the ambulance services operating um, within the county plus one from a countywide systems perspective at a cost of $210,000. Um, and then their, uh, their second option was five reports, one for each of the non-commercial services um, and then as well as a, a broad look at the two commercial services in addition to a, a countywide systems report. Uh, and that one, that option was $160,000. $160, and then their, their third option was one broad look at, uh, at all six ambulance services and a single countywide systems report at uh, the cost of uh, $65,000. Um, again, we are bringing this to you as a uh, briefing today. We're looking to bring this back. Uh, for consideration of, of action in two weeks on November 1st. Um, myself and uh, 
Linda Young, Emergency Management Director, are here uh, for any questions. But we have uh, included both of those proposals for your for your review and and uh, stand by for any questions. Thank you, Robert. Are there any questions for Robert, Commissioner Barth? So, Robert, uh, uh, are we looking at perhaps going from ALS in the rural area to EMS? Is that the kind of thing that we're studying? Or are we looking at whether or not we need a medical director? Uh, are these the issues that we're contemplating? Because honestly, as difficult as it was to find the money in the budget to support the existing ambulances, uh, I'm really not that happy about the idea of spending this kind of money for, you know, paper. And, that, and that's why we bring it forward for your uh, review this week and have it scheduled again next week for, for action. And I would turn it over to uh, uh, Lindy Young for uh, uh, some of the more technical feedback. <coughs> Commissioner Lindy Young. Um, so we've had those conversations and uh, sent emails back and forth. But I think, um, as I see it, the direction from the commission is, number one, we need to do a, a quick look. But within that look, we need to look at some key points. Uh, those key points include medical review. What level of medical review do we need? Currently, all the services have a medical uh, review system. The county also uh, retains Dr. Luther with a contract, but making sure all of that information comes together, we look at what happens out in the field, we get it to the county, and we see how that uh, revolves around patient care and then get it back. Do we need that system, or is the system across the country evolving so that we can do it in a more <laughs> efficient manner? Uh, the next level, or the next question would be is level of service um, that we uh, have indicated to them we want to look at. Uh, for example, right now in, in Minneapolis County, we have five paramedic level services at times. So Paramedics Plus, of course, um, uh, MedStar provides paramedic level service, Del Rapids does, Garrison does on a part-time basis, and Humboldt does. So is that the most efficient model with the best outcomes that the patients are looking for? Um, is that the most efficient model? Once again, with um, discussions on both of them, they said they'd be able to do a quick look at that and say, do we need those paramedic level services? Because those paramedic level services um, cost higher. Uh, there's a fewer amount of people that can provide those services because the countryside is not, you know, just doesn't have that uh, saturation within the market of paramedics. So looking at that, um, geographical distribution, do we have EMS uh, uh, units trans on the transport side uh, located in the right areas? Maybe there's a better way to do it that we haven't looked at. Um, maybe there's a more efficient way. Uh, once again, that'll be part of the review. Uh, government subsidies, once again, uh, the county provides funding for the services, the townships do, and the uh, communities in most areas do, but is that level of service, or is that funding what we should expect or what we could expect with a community of our size and the communities that they respond to? Uh, the volunteer inputs that they put in, you know, uh, none of these services could run without volunteers, so really that amount that they incorporate in is really a hidden amount. So, you know, what is that amount that uh, that's out there? If if their budgeted funds are X amount from government and they got this the volunteer subsidy, um, what is that? Uh, we know that it takes roughly six hundred and fifty thousand dollars to run a full time service, but then you take into account billing and a whole lot of other financial complexities, but we want to make sure we capture the volunteer inputs. And then uh, the other thing that we've asked them to look at is ordinance maintenance. Are we doing um, the right thing at the county level? Do we have a system in place to, to maintain the ordinance? So if minor day-to-day -day issues come up or a need for a call review comes up, um, just yesterday, uh, Carol and Robert and I and Dr. Luther had good discussions and you know, even based on the new way we're doing it, we still have a three-month window where if something happens, then who addresses that problem? Some of them are medical direction type of, of issues and others are maybe other layers of uh, uh, resolution to solve those. So within everything that Ro uh, Robert said, there are some key areas that we'll be looking forward and uh, both uh, Safe Tech and Fitch indicated that uh, their report would address those areas. Additional questions, Commissioner Kelly. Uh, Lynn, our b we only require right now basic life support, right? Correct. If, if they're doing advanced, that's their yep. deal. So if I can just uh, answer. Uh, well, yeah, and then can you also tell us what the advance offers versus the, the basic? Yep. So uh, the original 
uh, ordinance and the original funding for that the commission put uh, forth about 15 years ago was for daytime service at the BLS level. Our ordinance only uh, looks at BLS level, so when Dr. Luther does his review, he's really only doing the first, um, you know, the, from the first time a, a EMT puts his hands on the patient until the transition to paramedic level service, he's looking at the basic life support. So uh, spinal immobilization, uh, airway uh, opening and clearing if that's needed, CPR, those, uh, um, anything to do with you know bleeding and hemorrhaging, those type of things. Um, but all of our, or most of our services have transitioned over into extended hours of ALS. So today if you would be, uh, need an ambulance out in Humboldt, um, you would probably have a paramedic that arrives. So those first couple minutes, the paramedic will do basic level services and then they get into advanced level services uh, such as uh, administration of IV, uh, the uh, administration of different types of drugs that an EMT basic is not allowed, uh, airway uh, maneuvers, those type of things. Um, so as so currently we're looking at about 20, or Dr. Luther is really centered on 20% of of the work when there's another 80% of the work that's being done. And once again, what we're asking the consultant to do is really tell us, do we need those paramedic level services out there? Or maybe should we expand uh, the scope of, of medical review into the whole 100% of the call? But once again, there's financial impacts um, if you do that. And that, that'll be a policy level decision uh, that the commission will have to answer is if you look at the whole scope, then it's different and we need to be able to monitor those along with a paramedic uh, level service right now is uh, skills validation uh, to ensure that they're providing things based on um, the way their training and standard operating procedures indicate. Uh, and the, the paramedic requires a lot more ongoing training, does it Correct. not, than, than, than an EMT. Can the, can the EMTs do the... <coughs> The shock deal. <laughs> yep. So, and Can't that's a that is a basic level service is okay. cardiac resuscitation. And can and they do the Can they do the shots for the stroke with victims? Nope. So, if you have a stroke, they cannot administrate um, clot busting drugs like a paramedic could. But on most of those paramedic level services, they still still need medical direction. Uh, but an EMT cannot administer TPA or some of those other drugs for for uh, early onset uh, s stroke treatment. Additional questions or comments? Commissioner Berg? Well, I do appreciate that uh, Fitch is the lowest uh, bidder. I, I regret that they uh, have, were already involved in the, what appears to me anyway to be a, uh, the tangled mess with uh, REMSA, Paramedics Plus, et cetera. I, I sort of would rather have a, an outsider come in and take a look at us. I know that's more money, but uh, I sort of feel like uh, uh, I, I don't want them to be tainted by preconceptions and, uh, you know, or preconceived result from, from this study. And uh, I actually don't like spending the money either, but uh, if we're going to do it, I, it seems to me we ought to get someone that's uh, uh, new to the scene and that uh, can give us an, a truly objective view of what we want. Just a comment. I, I disagree with you, Jeff, because I think these people are professionals. I think they're able to set aside any any bias they had from a different one. I, I really think this is important. We've been struggling with this for, what, eight years? Maybe uh, more? The county uh -huh. started funding ambulance services in 2004, 2005, so yeah. whatever so, you so make I, that work. I do think it's time to get it, get it straightened out. Additional comments? It's bit, Commissioner Bender. So, I mean, I think there is some benefit that this consultant has already has some familiarity with Metro and kind of understands how that system works. Um, and I do believe that they're going to come in after having looked at this two years ago and be able to see the data and what actually happened over the last two years and, and be able to, you know, process that. Um, so I think that's helpful. I just am curious, you know, I mean, there is some concern that the price levels were so different and, and that the... Um, the one provider provided three different levels. I just um, am curious if you feel comfortable that Fitch is able to address the, the various levels, the various issues that we definitely have identified that we want reviewed. Well, um, 
of those six key indicators that we talked about, the medical review, the level of service, the ordinance maintenance, geographical distribution, <coughs> government subsidies, and volunteer inputs, that was a specific question put to them and asked for your price. You're going to be able to answer these questions along with, you know, the other things that naturally come up in a study, and they indicated that that was part of their proposal. Um, once again, those other two costs from, um, or those other costs from uh, Safe Tech, you know, they're, they would, um, especially the one for 210000 um, I just don't think we have the capability to tell the ambulance services, we're going to provide you with a uh, researcher to come in and tell you how to run your business and look at all the financial data. I don't think that that's what the study that needed to be done um, or I just don't think we as a county had the ability to tell them that especially with paramedics plus as a private provider and uh, Metro or MedStar as a private provider I, you know I don't know that we could do that um, and I think the other thing is a compressed time frame you know we had asked or the Commission had asked that this be done by um, budget time for next year and that's the other thing we're looking at so I'm not sure that I fully answered your question but um, we had you know the same discussions with both of them and um, Safe Tech decided to provide a tiered level of uh, possibilities for the county to look at. So, Safe Tech also included um, the op in, in, I think every one of theirs if they would do a a report on how we, we would go to a single system state our countywide, and we are not talking about that. So that would be unnecessary information gathered and put together for us because it's not something we were looking for. Yeah. And I just you know the other comment on Safe Tech is both of them have done work in South Dakota, which obviously. Uh, with the city but safe tech um, has been on a uh, not only a training contract with the state of south dakota um, but they've also helped in providing information uh, for what you saw last year that came out of the legislative session um, for the state when they brought the two emt level down to an emt plus an evoc driver so you know they are familiar with south dakota and some of the struggles that are out there for funding and uh, volunteer recruitment and maintenance and and some uh, just geographical distribution in a state as big as South Dakota also so I think it's been about probably at least 15 years since this has all been looked at and I think it's very important that the Commission goes back and spends yeah. the money and figures out if, we're, if we've got an appropriate sy system and that we are taking care of our citizens the way we should be rurally and I don't know that we can get up get that done with just being up here throwing money at it year after year without having somebody come in and look at it and make sure we're doing what we need to be doing so this was just a briefing and this will come back in a couple of weeks so if there are no more questions we will move on to <coughs> the next okay, item you. which is thank you Lynn and thank you Robert item number 14 is Minnehaha County liaison reports are there any reports Commissioner Kelly uh, on the library director we met yesterday uh, Carrie Deaver and I and um, the city folks and the library people and we went through 26 applications we called out down to those that were going to telephone interview next Monday and we'll spend the whole day doing that and hopefully come up with a recommendation to send to the mayor well first goes to the library board then to the mayor I think our involvement in it is concurrent but uh, should have somebody at least named within the next 30 days Thank you. Additional reports? Check. Is there any new business? Is there any old business? Old business. Um, just one note, and that is that the highway winter hours are scheduled effective for November 5th, 2016. We'll go into effect. Excuse me. We'll go into effect November, and I think it's 7:30 to 4. Shannon, is that correct? 7:30 to 4. Um, going into effect November 5th and that will go until spring hours when they change their time frame again so and with that I'd look for a motion to go into executive session for potential litigation personnel and contract negotiation it's my motion second and a second all those in favor say aye aye those opposed same sign motion passes unanimously we are adjourned <laughs> thank you for coming <laughs>